do you think that uh, you know after the elections because the pakistani government the pmln led government mm -hmm. and during the election campaign uh, its uh, supreme leader nawaz sharif he publicly said declared that uh, you know that his government mm -hmm. uh, will try everything to improve relations with the neighbors including india right and he also he also said that we want to uh, start uh, trade with india mm -hmm. and a big section of the the pakistani business community also wants to start uh, trade with india mm -hmm. you know yep uh, do you think that uh, there's a chances that uh, you know they can sit together and they can uh, improve relations and also to they, they, they can start the trade and uh, mm. things like that or you think that uh, in the uh, presence of modi government in india it will be difficult yeah i think you may be able to get the requisite support in pakistan to push that forward uh indeed the the PMLN uh you know i yeah. think for a lot of reasons is is very much into that idea as nawaz sharif is uh, maybe shabaz not as much so but i think his brother's influence could could sway the party uh it's unclear to me if the army here would be interested in 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 trade with india i think there's a very strong focus on this idea of need not doing much with india until the kashmir issue is addressed but it's not going to be addressed yeah. uh india won't do that but indeed i, I really feel that um you know there there's no space in modi's india in hindutva for this notion of moving closer to to in to pakistan honestly if if anyone in india would be in a position to pursue a peace process with yes. pakistan it would be modi, modi because yes. he's the hardliner he has that space it's sort of yeah. like the you know the nixon goes to china effect right you know he was that very conservative hardline leader that decided that he wanted to normalize ties with china and he had the you know the strength and the to 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 get away with that so to speak but modi as you'll know he made that surprise visit here yes. in lahore yeah. yes. almost a decade ago to meet with nawaz sharif when he was prime minister soon after that there was a terrorist attack in india and that basically ended it from india's perspective yeah. and that hasn't changed and then once you had other attacks and of course the pulwama attack i don't think that india has is going to have any interest and some would argue okay if modi's reelected he'll have a fresh mandate he'll have more political space to be bold and he likes to do bold moves yeah. but um i i just don't see that happening to me it seems like a a done deal um that not to mention india would not get the economic benefits um that pakistan would if you have more trade because pakistan is the weaker economy it really yeah. needs cheap indian imports of course that's also a reason why you have some strong interest in pakistan yes. particularly in agriculture and in the car industry that wouldn't want more trade with india but still much more resistance in india to trade with pakistan uh than there be in in pakistan yeah no mm. you're right you're right mm. that's the situation now uh if if you look back 20 or 30 years ago Mm -hmm. the situation was different exactly it was yes, uh, there mm -hmm. was more hard line taken right. by the pakistani governments mm -hmm. uh, compared to the india india was more keen so you do you think that uh, you know the the rise of indian uh, economic power uh, also played that uh, you know into that mm -hmm. you know because at the time the difference between india and pakistani economy was not as big and pakistan's economy was better it was times. better yes yeah. it was growing better than the right. indian economy but now it's the uh, other way around Mhm mm and India feels more confident now mm -hmm. you know to share you know the uh uh space with the uh, world powers and it it's considered itself as a global power now right and i i think they don't think that uh, you know the pak because the weakness of the pakistani economy uh, so the india thinks that uh, you know we can we we can ignore pakistan at the moment and then mm -hmm. we will see in the future if uh, we we need it you know to develop relations Mhm. Mm so you do you think that this is really the uh, you know the the Indian policy makers are really uh, no because in the press conferences when the Indian journalists they ask questions to the Indian uh, officials so they, they always brush aside you know that uh, Pakistan is not important you know? right it's exactly yeah, yeah. you know that sort of uh, mm -hmm. so we get the perception or or the feeling mm -hmm. that Indian leadership is not uh, very keen or interested right you know because they think they are you now a bigger power mhm mm and uh, you know they they can do whatever they want right know, and they will get away with that mhm mm you know and yeah i think there is something to that i think that in new delhi the view is that um the biggest external concern and the biggest external threat is china not pakistan they think they have pakistan managed they still worry about what they view as a cross border terrorism threat emanating from pakistan but yeah. i think they feel they have that managed they want to focus more attention on china and this is why you know we talk about how the relationship won't get better i would argue that india has an interest in the relationship with pakistan not getting worse 
And that, you know, this is why, you know, there was a truce, an LOC truce three yeah, years yeah, ago yes, yes. that lowered tensions. So I think India wants to keep, you know, keep temperatures Dump. down with Pakistan so that it could focus more on the China, uh, yeah. the China concern. But, um, you know, absolutely, uh, Paca India doesn't really want to think about Pakistan that much. And indeed, you, know, you turn on any TV channel in India, yeah, yeah. you're going to have these anchors yelling about Pakistan. I would argue that's performative, that, you know, it's really just part of this entertainment thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. The, the public in, in, in India is not in a mood for, tr for trade or peace with Pakistan, for the most part. And it's political, too. And, you know, the media networks in India in many cases are aligned with the Indian government, yeah. and they know that it's helpful for them to, yeah. bash, to bash Pakistan. But in New Delhi, there, people don't really, the, the, on a strategic level, Pakistan is not much of a factor. But getting back to your question about you know, the change in India's position vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, and particularly trade, it's true that it was before India became the economic power that it is now, when you had India more willing to pursue trade with Pakistan. You know, you go back to the early decades post-47, uh, yeah. even when the two countries were at war or having detentions, they maintained trade relations. Yep. And it was India, not Pakistan, that first extended uh, most favored nation status yep. to India, but, uh, to Pakistan, back in the 90s. But see, that was back then, when yeah. India's economy wasn't what it is. Yeah. Now India is more confident, it's more powerful, it feels that its economic cloud is perfectly fine, and it doesn't need to trade with Pakistan to, to, make, to get any more advantages. And, uh, you know, with that sort of relationship between the two major countries in South Asia, mm -hmm. how you view the future of uh, South Asian integration as a region, you know, the mm -hmm. trade, economy, and the other things? Right. Because, uh, you know, uh, India has a very good relations with Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. It has a good relations with Nepal. Yeah. You know, and uh, the great power struggle that is taking, the one power struggle is taking place with, on the global stage is between the... China and US, mm -hmm. but in the region, in our region, you know, there's also another power struggle going on between India and China. Indeed, yes. And they, and they are now interfering into different countries' affairs now. Mm -hmm. They wanted to elect the government, which right. is more inclined towards them or more supportive, mm -hmm. you know, like in Maldives election, in Nepalese election, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in Bangladesh, the situation is different because, right. yeah, because the Hasina Wajid government has been able to maintain a balance mm -hmm. between, not only between China and India, but also between China and, uh, and exactly. the US. Yeah. But it's not the case with, the, with Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so do you think that will, there are chances that in the coming years uh, there will be a more uh, you know, motivation or more concrete steps will be taken towards the regional integration? Or do you think that uh, Pakistan-India relations and the and the tensions will, uh, will, you know, will stop it uh, right. happening. And uh, so what is your views? Because SARC is dead. No meeting of the SARC right. took place in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And, and SARC is dead. And the main reason it's dead is because of the India-Pakistan yes. problem. It functions, decision making is based on unanimity. And given that India and Pakistan don't agree on anything, you're never going to have a decision yeah. that's made. So this is why it's dead. So I, what I've argued in some of my writing in recent months is that um, what we're seeing in South Asia is a sub-regionalization effect, not a regionalization effect. You're seeing India try to lead efforts within another regional organization called BIMSTEC, which is you know the Bay of Bengal. In, in, yeah. I don't know what the acronym is, but it, it's basically a regional organization yes. that includes all of the SARC members except for Pakistan and Afghanistan. Yes. So India is trying to energize BIMSTEC and develop integration projects under the BIMSTEC rubric, and it has had some success with that. Um, you know, there's an electricity sharing agreement that's near being implemented or soon be implemented between Bangladesh, Nepal, and India. India also has hopes of developing a a transnational rail corridor with Bhutan, yeah. another BIMSTEC member. But there's no space for Pakistan in this, or Afghanistan. So you have that dynamic with BIMSTEC, and then meanwhile Pakistan is looking west to Afghanistan, hoping to develop connectivity projects not only with Afghanistan, but with Central Asian states. So there's this fledgling uh, transnational rail project involving Pakistan and Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. Now, this is a little tricky because Pakistan has tensions with the Taliban now, but what I'm saying is that you have two different regional integration effects yeah. at play, but they're not region-wide. You've got one led by India and one led by, uh, by Pakistan. This is unfortunate 
because there's never been a time when there's a need for all of the countries in the region to work together, ideally through, through SARC, because you have these, these global, these regional and global challenges that know no borders, climate change, pandemics. Yes. During the pandemic, SARC tried to meet. They tried to have a meeting to talk about joint efforts to combat the pandemic, but it didn't work very well because of India and Pakistan. So it's sad, but yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't think there's going to be many prospects for regional integration, but sub-regionalization is what, what we are seeing now, and I think that will be what we'll see in the future, too. Uh, I, I would also uh, like to ask you the question that uh, if there is a direct military rule imposed in Pakistan or direct military intervention, what will be the American reaction to it? Because we have seen in the past, they, after some criticism, they mm -hmm. always accepted the military intervention, mm -hmm. they worked with them, you know, they supported them. Right. And uh, at least uh, two of the military dictatorships, they, they were not in, in a position to survive mm -hmm. without the American right. active help. So wh what is your thought on that uh, prospect that, uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, because we cannot rule out, you know, the direct military intervention in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Any time, right? It can happen because of the uh, you know the, the instability and uh, you know mm -hmm. you know what is happening around us or even internally. Yeah. So so I see you say the the least controversial question for last, <laughs> yeah. right? <Yeah. laughs> um, no, it's a great question. It's an interesting question. Um, it's hard to say because it's been a while since there's been a coup yeah. uh, in Pakistan. My own view is that we're unlikely to see a coup anytime soon, but you're right, nothing can be ruled out. Yeah. So very hypothetical here. If there were to be a coup, what would the U.S. reaction be? I imagine there would be a strong reaction from the U.S. Indeed, I think that the U.S. is perfectly comfortable working with and even uh, working with the army and, and favoring the army even vis-a-vis -vis the civilian government so long as there is a facade of civilian rule, so long as there is formal civilian rule, which of course there has been for the last, what, 15, 16 years. Yes. But if the, if the army were to formally take over, and particularly if it was done violently, then I think that you would have condemnations from the United States. There's not enough at stake for the U.S. and its relationship with Pakistan where it would want to sort of hold back yeah. and not, you know, if this was during the war on terror era, you know, we saw the U.S. was perfectly happy to work with Musharraf. They've yes. worked with many military dictators yes. in the past. But this time is different because it's not in Afghanistan anymore. You know, still trying to figure out what the relationship should look like. So I think that it would be comfortable and, and content, with, so to speak, with condemning a military coup. And perhaps that could even trigger sanctions from the U.S. if, if that were to happen. Again, you know, one never knows uh, for sure, but just given the nature of the U.S. relationship with Pakistan, I think that from Washington's perspective, there's not enough at stake to make yeah. the U.S. hold back and, and be sort of quiet and, and tolerate a military coup in ways that it was willing to do so back in the day, certainly during the, the Cold War and, and, of course, you know, during the War on Terror uh, era as well. I certainly hope this remains a hypothetical and that we don't need yeah, to talk yeah, about this no. question in real time, though. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, nobody really liked to discuss right. this question because we have suffered a lot Indeed, under yeah. the military dictatorships and, uh, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, people have struggled against the you know, for the democracy, for the constitutional order, all these things. Absolutely, and we have yeah. paid a heavy price for the mm -hmm. for this democratic order, whatever shape it is. You know, right. It's not ideal, but still we are still have uh, rights. We can criticize our mm -hmm. governments, you know, we can come out on the streets. Mm -hmm. So we are enjoying some, some degree of uh, freedom. Not ideal, but yes, still. But, uh, yeah, something to be said for an imperfect democracy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are yeah. many imperfect democracies out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's mainly thanks to the, the flawed transition yeah. from the one military dictatorship, dictatorship to the democracy and then back to the military mm -hmm. dictatorships. So it's a vicious cycle that uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were caught in. But now, uh, for 16 years, we are without any military intervention. Uh, democracy is taking roots now. Mm -hmm. You know, in, uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's not like uh, very weak. It was used to be. Right. Yeah, but still, law depends in for the democratic order to establish or to democracy. You know, elections taking place, and the civilian governments after one or the other mm -hmm. taking power. It's mainly due to the uh, to the military. You know, they they don't want to intervene. <laughs> yes. You know, and that is one aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Because the one question I just want to ask you is that uh, uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago uh, when I was young mm -hmm. and you, you also were young I think uh, America was the big player in Pakistan mm -hmm. even in the internal politics you know America enjoyed a huge 
cloud here. But now, in last uh, at least two decades, China has also has established mm -hmm. good relations with the Pakistani political parties, with the state organs, and right. because of the investment, because of the increased role of China in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So now America is not a sole power, you know, who can uh, uh, like uh, decide things, mm -hmm. you know, at its own, at it used to be, because uh, there was a saying in Pakistan in the past that, uh, uh, you know, the power in Pakistan is not uh, goes directly to Islamabad. You have to go via Washington. Mm. You, you, <laughs> you need to have a good relations right. if you want to get power in Pakistan. So do you think that this dynamic has changed and now there are more powers involved in the, uh, you know, in the process and it's not the U.S. Mm -hmm. who can dictate terms as it was used to be in, 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 you know, in the past? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I agree with you. I think that um, uh, we should not overstate U.S. influence uh, today. I mean, certainly it is influential yeah. in the sense that you know, it's very influential within the IMF, which is very yeah. important for Pakistan. It's, it's influential just because of how it's seen by Pakistan. I think that, you know, cues, what U.S. officials do, what they think, it's, it's watched very carefully uh, by both the civilian and the military uh, leaderships in, in, in Pakistan. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a different time. I mean, as I've uh, implied earlier, the U.S., the, the current administration does not view Pakistan as a top 10 relationship, quite frankly, yeah. or even a top 15 relationship. Yes. So... You know, I mean, there's always that inherent strategic significance that the U.S. will feel toward Pakistan because of its location, you know, the countries it's close to, like China and Saudi Arabia, you know, the, the nuclear weapons reality uh, and all of that. So to be seen as significant for inherent reasons, but on tactical levels, you know, the U.S. doesn't really have much of a stake in Pakistan in a broad sense. It's move on to other things. It's focusing on its great power competition. So... Um, yeah, it's not like the U.S. is hovering over Pakistan. Yeah, yeah. And I think that this certainly, you know, we know what's happened in the past, right? We know that there had been a period where you had a pretty strong military relationship. There had been a period where you had a strong uh, uh, U.S. covert presence yeah. in, in Pakistan going back to the Cold War and, of course, yeah. during the, the War on Terror era, um, you know, until around 2011 or 2012. But things are just different now. Uh, you know, you just don't have the U.S.'s... I mean, the U.S. is engaged in Pakistan. For, you know, we discussed the various cooperation yes. initiatives at play, U.S. AIDS work, State Department, its, its initiatives. But, um, yeah, I think that there are other powers that are much more present and influential. China, absolutely, for the most part. But not just China. You know, you look at, um, you know, at some of the European countries. Uh, you know, Germany has a very yes. significant development presence. Japan is very yes. quietly a key partner. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, UK, and also the Gulf states, which have long been close to Pakistan, yes. uh, the Saudis, but also the UAE and, and Qatar. So I think that there's a number of, and Turkey too, let's not forget yeah, Turkey. Yeah, Turkey yes. So I think that, I don't want to say the US has completely receded from the scene, but I think it's, it's a more multilateral uh, situation, yes. so to speak. Uh, the, and the US is definitely not the most, ex the most powerful or even the most influential external actor in Pakistan anymore. Uh, my last question will be that, uh, do you think that uh, if Pakistan uh, go ahead with the Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline, will the U.S. sanction, impose sanctions, or they will just ignore it? Or Yeah, that's a good question. I can't imagine the U.S. being willing to tolerate it. Um, you know, if it were three years ago or even two years ago, maybe so, but the U.S. relationship with Iran has just deteriorated so much, yeah. particularly since October 7th. And, you know, the, the U.S. doesn't really give free passes to any of its partners that do business with Iran. You know, even India, which gets free passes from the U.S. Yeah. on other issues, even India completely reduced its energy imports from Iran, yeah. not wanting to risk U.S. sanctions. This was some years ago. So I just don't think the U.S. will be willing to, um, to overlook this. Now, so if Pakistan submits a formal sanctions waiver, which I think it has not done yet but plans to, you know, the U.S. I think would it would it would be it would not want to have to sanction Pakistan. I think it would want to work out, out work around, so to speak. What could Pakistan do that would in, that would allow the U.S. not to have to sanction yes. Pakistan? Yeah, there are various possibilities. Maybe it would mean Pakistan starts to build its part of the pipeline, but it doesn't complete it. Uh, of course, that might not be enough to appease Iran. But I just think that 
first, I, I imagine in Washington there's a view that Pakistan won't actually complete it, just because for so many years Pakistan yeah. has been saying it will, it's never followed through. But if it does start to build it, I think that, pa that the U.S. would hope that it doesn't build enough that it would trigger sanctions, meaning yeah. it wouldn't build enough that there's actually energy imports coming in through the pipeline. But uh, yeah, Pakistan's in a tough spot, right? It either, yeah. builds, it either builds the pipeline and risks sanctions, or it doesn't build it and risks a very pricey uh, fine. Yeah, neither, yeah. neither are good options. So it, it has to come up with a workaround. And uh, you know, I don't envy Pakistani policymakers for having to work through that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, I, you know, I just want to ask you one more question. And that is, do you think really, what is your analysis about the situation that the Pakistani governments or the Pakistani ruling class Mm -hmm. is capable of readjusting its relationship with the with the US or they are what is your reading that uh, you know you have interactions with the pakistani officials right so what is your reading what is your analysis that uh, is pakistan ready to accept the reality and to rearrange or readjust its relationship with the US i mean honestly since uh, the, since the la the, we've had the last few governments in place, the government t took over after Khan's uh, ouster, and then the caretaker and now the current government, the messaging is all very pro-U.S. There yeah, clearly yeah. is a desire to work with the U.S. Yeah. And uh, you know, Pakistani officials try to make this argument that Pakistan is not in the China camp, that it wants to have good relations with both the U.S. and China. And I think the U.S. is receptive to that as well. So, and, and as I said earlier, there's no crisis in the relationship. Yeah. So there's no reason, there's no good reason for Pakistan's civilian and more importantly military leaders to, you know, to sort of back away from this idea of pushing closer to the U.S. And you know, let's be clear, given the state of Pakistan's economy, the U.S. Is, has long been the top export destination yes. for Pakistan, yeah. highly influential in the political economy of Pakistan because yes. of the IMF factor. So. Pakistani officials can't afford to move further away from the U.S. I think that reason alone gives Pakistan a strong incentive to want to telegraph this, this message of wanting to have better relations uh, with the U.S. And, you know, we've seen there have been some potential trigger points, right? When we saw there was a recent human rights report from the State yes, Department yes. critical of Pakistan. It didn't cause a crisis. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had the sanctions on Chinese companies for uh, yeah, doing ballistic, business. Ballistic yeah, program, right. Yeah. You yeah. know, naturally Pakistan rejected that, but it didn't cause a crisis. So I think Pakistan has no choice but to try to, to hope that it can get its relationship with the U.S. on a better plane. Thanks very much, Michael, for yeah. your time. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, thanks very much for, the, for your presence. Thank you. It's a great conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was the program today. And uh, I hope the audience will enjoy that program. Thanks very much. And Allah Hafiz.